Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Climate Change and Monetary Policy How Far Have We Come uh, session. I'm very pleased to see you here back today on, uh, with the Civil Society webinar. You are important stakeholders and we announced important climate measures today. So I'm really pleased that we have an excellent panel today for you to present the measures we announced uh, and have a discussion with you to answer your questions and hear your feedback. We have in our uh, panel today, Frank Elveson, executive board member of the European Central Bank, Toto Silvon, and deputy director at the market operations uh, business area, and Elke Heinle, head of the division at risk management. Both three of them are uh, very heavily involved in the work and they're uh, I'm sure uh, they can give an excellent presentation. So Frank, first I want to give the floor to you to uh, give an introduction of all the measures we have taken. So that means actually all the central banks in the Euro system decided to account for climate change in our corporate bond purchases, in our collateral framework, um, disclosure requirements, and risk management. So my, my colleagues here, um, Toto and Elke, uh, will tell you more uh, about the specificities of these measures. But before giving them uh, the floor, I would like to somehow set the scene by explaining and recalling what the role of the European Central Bank is and how the actions fit within our mandate and what is next. The ECB takes climate change very seriously. And why is that? Well, climate change has clear macroeconomic and financial implications and has consequences for price stability. As such, the ECB Governing Council is firmly committed to address these consequences. These measures announced today are designed in full accordance with the Eurosystem's primary objective of maintaining price stability. And they aim, they aim to better take into account climate-related financial risk in the Eurosystem balance sheet. The measures also support, without prejudice to our price stability objective, and with reference to our secondary objective, the green transition of the economy in line with the EU's climate neutrality objectives. Moreover, our measures provide incentives to companies and financial institutions to be more transparent about their, excuse me, <coughs> to be more transparent about their carbon emissions and to reduce them. With these measures, we set important steps to systematically and consistently integrate climate and environmental considerations into our activities. But we will not stop here. Looking ahead, the Governing Council is committed to regularly reviewing all the measures outlined above. We will assess their effects and adapt them if necessary, to confirm that they continue to fulfill their monetary policy objectives, two, to ensure within our mandate that the relevant measures continue to support the decarbonization path to reach the goals of the Paris Agreement and the EU climate neutrality objectives, and three, to respond to future improvements in climate data and climate risk modeling and changes in regulation. And fourth, to address additional environmental challenges within our mandate. Now, finally, uh, before I give the floor uh, to my colleagues, uh, let me put um, our actions in some perspective. Governments and parliaments have the primary responsibility to mitigate the effects of climate change because they have the most appropriate toolbox to do so. 
monetary policy and banking supervision cannot be a substitute for ambitious and decisive fiscal and regulatory action. But nevertheless, we all have a duty to do our part and ask ourselves how we can contribute to the fight against climate change. And this is a task for all of us, including the ECB. Therefore, I'm pleased to announce that today we also publish our ECB-wide climate agenda. This, this climate agenda provides a comprehensive overview of the climate actions that we are taking at all fronts. From supervision and financial stability to our macroeconomic modeling work and producing our banknotes in a more sustainable manner. With these commitments taken together, we aim to make a real difference with the tasks that we have been given and within the mandate that we have. So thank you um, once again, looking forward to a lively conversation and um, glad to pass the floor uh, to my colleagues. Uh, yes, uh, th thanks so much, Frank, for your introductory remarks. Uh, Toto and Elke, please, uh, I think you have a wonderful presentation ready. Uh, so I, I have to give the floor to you. Thank you, Frank, and thank you, Irene. And good afternoon, um, everyone. It's very nice to be here and explain to you what we've been busy with the last uh, 12 months. I thought I'd give a few slides uh, and a little bit background, and then we have the time for our Q&A and uh, hopefully get feedback of any kind from, from you. So if you move to uh, the first slide, or let's move to the second slide then, uh, you see, uh, well, first of all, let me just uh, uh, clarify that uh, we are doing a lot of work in all areas, in the supervisory side as well, and then uh, also in the finance stability side. But today we focus on monetary policy. And the justification a year ago for these measures that we will now uh, introduce are given from uh, two sides. The first one is that the climate change and the green transition, so both the physical risk and the transition risk, impact different macroeconomic indicators, inflation, but also growth, employment, finance stability, and therefore the transmission of our monetary policy. And that's why we have to take it, the climate change into account with our operational framework. The second point on the right side is that the climate change as well as transition affects the value and risk profile of assets that we hold in our balance sheet and therefore leading to greater climate related financial risk which we have to manage like any central bank and so that's a natural part of uh, our uh, monetary policy framework as well now if you move to the next slide uh, i'll start in the middle uh, something that is very typical for any central bank is analytical capacity and we are, after last year's uh, strategy review, expanding this capacity in modeling and forecasting different economic and financial effects. That's from our monetary policy side. Then the second part of the work for this year is on the left side, which is where we will focus to incorporate these uh, ideas into our framework and operations. And the th third part on the right side is more of the ECB at the micro institutional level. We are also implementing action plan to our environmental sustainability disclosure and reporting. So let's move to the next slide and more specifically on the four focus areas. There's, there's actually six focus areas. We also work uh, on the statistical data side to improve the uh, data clarifications. And we all work with the modeling on the, on the right side, but that's not the topic of today. We will focus on these four areas where we have announced actions in each that corporate bond purchases, disclosure requirements, collateral framework, and risk assessment. So let's, uh, let's move to the more concretely what we have decided. If you move one more slide. So here I'll go clockwise, and uh, I should have uh, introduced uh, Elke Heinle also, who has been a so-called co-lead with me from a risk management side. So everything that we've done, we work together with the markets where I come from and risk management where Elke comes from, but also in very close cooperation, as Frank mentioned, with the legal experts and monetary policy experts. Uh, so that means that we have a very comprehensive and holistic approach 
on any of the measures that we've considered. So uh, today uh, we have announced that on our corporate bond purchases, we have decided to adjust the market capitalization benchmark to account for climate change factors. And I will tell detail in how we do it, how we plan to do it. The second uh, part, which also was led by so-called market side, is disclosure requirements. We will uh, lean on the CSRD-based disclosure requirements for issuers. I will explain it more in detail. But also, there are instruments which are not covered by the regulation, and we plan to act as a catalyst to promote uh, more harmonized mandatory disclosure also for different type of uh, uh, structured finance instruments. And then the third area is collateral framework. We have assessed uh, uh, the different type of risks and uh, come up with a plan for collateral composition limits, as well as integrate climate change risks in our haircut reviews. And the final area is risk assessment. We will externally engage for more transparency in credit ratings, and internally, we will set up common standards for Eurostem in-house credit assessment systems. So if you move to the next slide, we can start with the corporate bond holdings, which are quite sizable, and, and these holdings can be under our asset purchase program or under pandemic and emergency purchase program. So altogether, we hold a little under 400 billion of corporate bonds. Our aim is that um, we now have decided to set up a tilting approach uh, with an aim to gradual decarbonization of all these holdings on a path which is aligned with the goals of Paris and alignment. And uh, our reinvestments, uh, which will start basically from now on, will be tilted towards issuers with better climate performance at the expense or relative to those issuers with, which have a worse climate performance. And this uh, kind of appro approach includes three different elements. So we tilt this market capitalization benchmark in a favor of, uh, we look backwards, we look forward, uh, forward looking indicators, and then we look also for disclosure quality elements. So we will tilt in favor of issuers with lower carbon emissions, uh, that's the backward looking part, issuers with more ambitious reduction targets, that's the forward looking part, and then at the moment issuers who have a better climate related disclosures. So all those three elements are included with the so-called climate performance. We plan to start the implementation as of October 22, when we have uh, everything uh, set up in our systems. And additionally, we already announced, um, I think a, a couple of years ago, that there will be an annual publication of climate-related information on uh, so-called non-monetary policy portfolios. But this will include also our corporate bond holdings. Uh, and we start this in the first quarter of 20 three and uh, we will plan to do it uh, regularly on an annual basis. Let's move to the second measure. So uh, the second measure is about the disclosure requirements. Uh, we will base our eligibility requirement for corporate sustainability reporting directive. Uh, this was also announced in the uh, action plan last year. There's been a slight delay due to the complexity of the system, but uh, this uh, agreement has been now reached just some weeks ago among different European institutions, and we will apply our disclosure requirements to all companies within the scope of the CSRD, so all type of uh, uh, non-financial uh, uh, companies. And this will uh, have a gradual kind of application starting from 26. There are currently some larger uh, companies which are already under the current uh, NFRD framework, and then there will be some more large companies that will uh, start to disclose on 27, and uh, finally some large SMEs or unlisted SMEs, no, sorry, listed SMEs in 27. So they will gradually implement these disclosure requirements. But not every type of asset is under the CSRD regulation, and uh, we feel that uh, it's important to support better and harmonized disclosure of uh, climate-related data, particularly from asset-backed securities and covered bonds. And this is because we accept quite a lot of collateral for that type of assets. Uh, that's what is mentioned in the first bullet point. This is something that uh, we see our role more as a catalyst, but we will, will close very closely with uh, 
uh, European market authorities, for example, the uh, European Securities Markets Authority in, in case of asset backed securities. And now I will uh, give the floor to um, Elke on for collateral framework. Thank you, Toto. So on, on the collateral framework, in line with the Eurosystem's action plan, um, the Eurosystem had, has reviewed its risk control framework to ensure that climate change risks are adequately reflected. As a result of this review, the Eurosystem has decided to adopt two measures. The first measure relates to the setting up of collateral pool composition limits for each individual counterparty that participates in Eurosystem credit operations. So going forward, the Eurosystem will limit the share of high carbon assets that these counterparties can mobilize as collateral when borrowing from the Eurosystem. At the beginning, this measure will be applied to marketable debt instruments issued by non-financial corporations. This is because here the financial risks are the highest and also because data quality here is, is the best. And as this data quality improves, the measure could also be extended to additional asset classes, such as marketable debt instruments issued by financial in entities, so-called uncovered bank bonds, and also to private sector non-marketable debt instruments, so-called credit claims or, or bank loans. The implementation of such of these collateral pool limits depends on a number of operational and technical preconditions in the Eurosystem's collateral management systems. We expect a go live of this new measure by end of 2024. But to encourage banks and other counterparties to prepare early for these collateral pool limits, we will run tests of the limits regime ahead of the actual implementation. Further details on this will be, will be communicated then in due course. The second measure relates to incorporating the climate risk dimension as part of our regular reviews of the risk control framework. So in concrete terms, we will assess on an annual basis the adequacy of our haircuts that we apply to our corporate bonds that we accept as collateral vis-a-vis -vis the climate risk dimension. So one day, if warranted, we may then apply differentiated haircuts based on this climate risk dimension. For instance, it could be lower haircuts for low emitting corporates or higher haircuts for high emitters. As also pointed out by Frank Alderson, all collateral measures related to climate change need to ensure that monetary policy continues to be implemented effectively. For the collateral framework, this means that all measures need to ensure and will ensure that ample collateral remains available. Let me then turn to the next slide, please. So in the area of risk assessment and risk management, we had committed in our action plan to scrutinize the credit ratings that we use to determine eligibility for our collateral assets, as well as our assets bought in the purchase programs. For our marketable assets, we mainly use the assessments of the credit rating agencies. As you may know, the Eurosystem currently accepts the ratings of the four largest credit rating agencies, namely Fitch, Moody's, Standard & Poor's, and DBRS. And we have therefore conducted an in-depth research on how these four credit rating agencies currently incorporate climate change risks in their credit rating methodologies. While all rating agencies, we really have to acknowledge this, have improved the level of disclosure in recent months, there's still quite some heterogeneity of climate risk disclosure. And um, there's also still scope for improvement. This heterogeneity is not only across the rating agencies, but it's also across the various asset classes that the rating agencies provide credit assessments for. The Eurosystem will therefore urge further rating agencies to become more transparent about how they incorporate climate risks into their ratings 
and to be also more ambitious in their disclosure requirements on climate risks. The Eurosystem is also in close dialogue with the relevant authorities on this matter, in particular, the European Securities and Markets Authority, ESMA. So for our non-marketable assets, the Eurosystem has put in place several national central, so in several national central banks have put in place so-called in-house credit assessment systems. In Eurosystem jargon, they are also called ICASs. So these ICASs are operated in a, on a decentralized basis by the national central banks and have to adhere to some common rules and principles. To better account for climate change risks in these ratings, the Eurosystem has agreed on a set of common minimum standards for how these systems should include climate-related risks in their ratings. These standards will need to implement it now in all systems by all national central banks by the end of 2024. Finally, on risk assessment and risk management, let me also recall that our action plan foresees the setup of a climate stress test of the Eurosystem's balance sheet. We have already run a first internal pilot climate stress test that is currently being further refined. We plan to publish our first results in the context of our climate-related disclosures in the first quarter of 2023, in line with our commitment in the action plan. And I then will hand back to Irene. Thank you. Thank you so much, Frank, uh, Toto and Elke for the presentation. I think it all shows uh, that we're really moving into the implementation phase because now we're getting technical. Uh, so I want to open the floor to all the participants today uh, for a Q&A. Any questions you may have uh, also on technical um, uh, clarifications, if need be. Um, just a few housekeeping rules. Uh, please uh, raise your hand uh, if you want to ask a question. Uh, secondly, it would be great if you can have your camera on because we can see you and it's a, it's a, more, a bit more personal interaction. And uh, if you don't speak, please mute yourself. Uh, I think you know the tricks for uh, all these conferences. And please know that also this, um, this uh, webinar will be recorded and, uh, and probably uh, or we expect to publish it soon as well on our website. So that's I think also good to know. Um, I don't know if I see any hands for the moment, any questions, maybe it's all clear. So that's, uh, that would have been great. I just, uh, uh, because I know there are some, some experts in the, in the, in the participants uh, room today. So I was hoping that you have uh, questions for us because we're happy to answer them and also hear your observations. Anyone who wants to break the ice. I noticed that um, oh, I see a, I see a hand um, and I want to give uh, Martin uh, the floor. Martin, if you could please uh, introduce yourself quickly and then ask your question. Thanks so much. Yes, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, yes. Okay, great. So I'm Martin Charles-Reed from Compassy Families Europe, we're a European NGO representing families and citizens. So I have a question about financial stability and climate change, because there was a lot of focus during the presentation on reporting, monitoring, and creating provisions to mitigate risk. But there seems to be a deeper discrepancy between the debt-based monetary system we have, whose stability relies on nice and stable growth, a rollover of credit into infinity, a stable debt to GDP ratio for states, and a more or less parallel growth of the monetary mass compared to the total amount, amount of available goods and services, with ideally this 2% inflation, which encourages consumption and discourages hoarding money for too long. And then on the other hand, you have the reality of climate change, which will throw a wrench into this nice stable picture. So the coronavirus pandemic and the war between Russia and Ukraine look like dress rehearsals for the kind of challenges that climate change might bring up, disrupting supply chains, creating demand crunches or supply shocks, now, do you believe that the ECB with its limited policy tools, which mostly rely on tweaking the level of interest rates and quantitative easing, are fit for achieving financial and economic stability? And are you considering other monetary theories which could replace the debt-based monetary system to address this 
fluctuation that will um, come about with climate change. Thank you very much. Well, Thank you so much, uh, Martin. I, I think I can give the floor maybe to Frank. Or I don't know who wants. Uh... Maybe, maybe I I can kick off and 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 yes. then then maybe Toto want to uh, want to add. Um, you know, um, but I would like to to highlight maybe as a um, a more general response um, to what I might uh, maybe. Um, Qualify as, as your cri de coeur, which I understand very well, and that is, you know, the, 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 will what you propose today, um, and will that actually, uh, you know, make make the difference? And you know, I think the answer is um, uh, it goes back to what I said in my introductory uh, word. Um, at, we at the European Central Bank are not climate policy makers. We are uh, what we say climate policy takers. Um, so the main, excuse me, I have this little cough, so you have me to excuse me. Um, um, the, the ECB um, um, uh, is taking policies uh, as a given by, by those uh, who are elected officials, uh, who have uh, a toolbox that goes much more directly to, to climate policies. And that having been said, uh, it is clear that, um, and I totally agree with you, um, and the, uh, you know, climate change is, I think, the biggest challenge uh, um, of, uh, of humankind uh, in this century. Uh, it is existential. Um, so within our mandate, uh, and, and, and I keep on repeating that, and that is, that is relevant, uh, within our mandate, um, uh, we, um, uh, you know, we have assessed um, how climate change affects uh, macroeconomic variables, uh, how it affects growth, how it affects um, uh, employment, financial stability, price stability, the monetary um, um, uh, the, the, um, the transmission mechanism. Um, and hence, uh, we see a concrete role for ourselves. But within that hierarchy of actors, if you like. But, but Toto, please uh, build on that. Thank you, Frank. I was about to say the same as, as what you started with that. Uh, uh, we are a policy taker, not a maker. And the measures that we come up today, they should and they will accommodate any monetary policy stance. The stance is the most important decision that the governing council uh, decides. And then we have now taken into account this uh, climate change risk, which is more complex and a longer term risk. But we, for the first time, accommodate it uh, or take it in different ways uh, into our monetary policy framework. Uh, that's that's one part, but there are also different dimensions. Uh, you mentioned the financial stability risk. That has been discussed uh, and agreed already earlier when the Frank started in the NGFS. That was the first kind of agreement among central banks and supervisors that uh, climate change is a financial risk. And our financial stability side is doing the economy-wide climate change stress test to inform which type of all channels are in general affected. And then we have the supervisory side, which is doing they own part for stress test. And then uh, on the risk management side, I give the floor to Elke, but we've kind of brought that stress test back to a uh, uh, monetary policy implementation framework level in order to manage our, our risks. So it comes in kind of different aspects in different levels uh, into the central bank's activities. Elke, would you? Yes, maybe, yeah, maybe very shortly. So um, in line with our focus on, on the primary objective, of course, what we have done is we really uh, turned every single stone in a, in a way of checking that, um, that climate change risks as a, as a matter of financial risk that we ac appropriately accommodate for that. And so as, as you have seen when presenting the measures, they all have a financial risk component. And that was what was driving also our, our broad approach on, on climate change risks. And um, as, as Toto has also pointed out, so financial stability is, is dealt with in a separate work stream on, on climate change. Thanks so much, uh, the three of you, of, uh, of giving such a complementary answer of the mandate and also on how the different uh, activities of the ECB work together on this. Um, I hope this answers your question, Martin. Uh, I have another question uh, hand raised from 
where Rens van Tilburg from the Sustainable Finance Lab uh, rents uh, the floor is yours. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Irene. Um, and uh, well, I've, I've got uh, one compliment and uh, three questions. Um, so let's start with the compliment. Uh, so I would like to thank all of you very much for, uh, for taking these very important steps. I think we're witnessing indeed uh, what you can call a watershed moment with the ECB taking action um, and, and going beyond the risk perspective there. Um, I think that was something I found very interesting that uh, you put so much emphasis on uh, supporting the green transition of the economy. Um, so, so I think that's our very good, uh, good developments. Then my three questions. Um, uh, so the first one is there is this focus on uh, marketable debt instruments, uh, partly also because uh, that's where, uh, where, where we have the, uh, the data for available. Um, um, but uh, my question is, um, uh, um, uh, how do you see the possibilities to actually step up there, uh, the action a bit? Um, and not only waiting for the CSRD, uh, but indeed uh, uh, setting a standard um, yourself as an ECB, for instance, uh, around the collateral framework. Um, so also moving into uh, the bank loans that have already been mentioned, um, because I would say, um, and my question is, do you agree with that, that the moment that the ECB would actually put a standard there and say also for the smaller bank loans, we don't want to have uh, too large concentrations in, uh, in fossil intensive companies, um, that banks will actually come up with those data. Um, and I think there's also a push from, uh, from supervision to come up with the same kind of, uh, of data. Um, and then we don't need to wait for, because that's uh, essentially what, what you put on the table now until 2026, uh, before we, 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 we do this for the largest companies, but we can also do it for the smaller ones. Um, my second question is on uh, the one instrument that I think is still very much missing in action, uh, the Teltro. Uh, which has been identified by the NGFS as po probably the most potent instrument for, uh, for monetary policy. Um, I would say especially for the Eurozone with its very strongly bank-based uh, economy. And I, I was actually getting some hope uh, because uh, uh, President Lagarde was, uh, was, was, was talking about this uh, more recently, saying we need to consider this, uh, but I don't see any reference to it. So my question is, are you actually still considering uh, the Teltro? Um, and the third and last question is there's a mentioning of a, a regular review, uh, which I think will be very important, uh, but how regular will this be? So will this be something that we have every year or, uh, well, happy to hear. But thank you very much for these uh, important steps. Thank, thank you very much, uh, uh, Rens. Um, uh, let me start uh, really quickly and then I'm sure uh, um, my colleagues will want to, um, to add. Um, actually, I was hoping that you were saying that we would have uh, gotten, uh, gotten from you three compliments and one question. But this is this is good enough. Um, maybe um, starting uh, with the bottom, the regular review. I think it's 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 important that you pick this out from our communication, from our um, um, press release, because it shows that we are not saying um, you know we took a year to think about this action plan and this is it. Um, what we have said is that yes, we have our primary objective, but yes, we also have a secondary objective. And the secondary objective, without prejudice, of course, without prejudice to the, final, to the primary objective, is there, and it's a legal obligation. Uh, and we tend to take legal obligations uh, um, uh, seriously, as you can understand. So that means, again, without prejudice to price stability, um, if uh, there is developments in um, uh, in data, in modeling, um, in um, uh, you know, also broader than just climate, uh, environmentally. Um, we will take further steps, and that means, uh, and this brings me um, to your, and your question was, how often will we do this? Uh, well, um, um, we have not pre-established that, is the, uh, is the, uh, the, the factual answer. Um, uh, we have said that we will, and so to you, I just explained, we will come out uh, with data in terms of, you know, the decarbonization path of our um, uh, corporate uh, bond holdings. We've also said that we will be in alignment uh, with, uh, with, you know, with, with, with uh, the EU um, uh, and Paris um, and climate neutrality goals. Um, so a, a logical uh, thing to do would be that if we noticed that we were lagging behind uh, that, that alignment, uh, we would see what we could uh, do more. Um, in terms of Steltro, um, I think it's uh, fair to say um, that, you know, having said what I just said, there is no um, no specific 
um, instruments that are off the table. Uh, but it's also true that the governing council, when it's uh, agreed on its action plan, um, um, you know, um, decided on a number of priorities. Uh, those we have now um, addressed. Uh, but um, it could very well be that in uh, um, uh, in these, uh, you know, uh, subsequent revisions, um, um, other uh, other instruments might come up at some point. Maybe I leave the uh, the other question uh, to you, Tara. Okay. Uh... First, on this uh, marketable debt versus others, uh, it's true that there's much more data available from corporate bonds, and that's why we take this step to actually make a concrete tilting in our reinvestments. But then we noticed when we went deeper that uh, despite all the talk, there's not really anything even in the pipeline for more harmonized reporting, mandatory reporting in certain asset classes within the euro area. And, and there, we are not the standard setters, but I feel that we can do a lot to cooperate and act as a catalyst and, uh, and uh, kind of develop together with the uh, institutions which are responsible to have a meaningful and relevant standards that we can then possibly build later on some, um, some uh, measures. You asked about the, I guess you meant green TLTRO, even though you talked about TLTROs. Uh, that was discussed a year ago, but it was not prioritized for this first year. So we have focused on all these measures at the moment, if one considers ever such an instrument and, and nothing is outside the, the considerations and we gradually move forward with new ideas, but one has to take into account the stance first. What's monetary policy stance? What type of uh, instruments and measures you in general take? And the second part is about the data. Do you have a harmonized data from all 19 jurisdictions that you can base and really monitor that uh, if you have a certain conditions uh, that they are fulfilled? So we didn't consider green TLT at this stage, but it's not uh, completely off the table. And as you mentioned, how often I would just add that uh, we have always thought that all these measures are scalable, that stars will develop, the data sources will develop. We only have our own sources chosen a month or two, two ago. So we definitely plan to do this regular review, at least on an annual, annual basis. But we first need to have a certain experience, and that will come, for example, when we disclose the the emissions of our CSPP portfolio during the first quarter of next year. Thanks a lot, uh, Toto and uh, Frank. Uh, very clear answer for me. And uh, I want to, Elke, okay, do you want to add something on this? Uh... We just very shortly on, on the regular reviews. I think, um, as, as, I, as I pointed out on the haircut reviews, so we have committed now to each year to check, to, to incorporate the climate risk dimension and to see whether different haircut, differentiated haircuts incorporated the climate change risks dimension are warranted. And I would say when we review any risk framework in the future, we will naturally now also look into the climate risk dimension. I think it has become an integral part of our assessments now. And I think this is a very important step that is thinking we are, we are really thinking now also in the climate change risk dimension perspective. And on the, just very shortly on the credit claims and by when we would do something, let me just point out on the collateral framework, on the collateral pool limits, we are not going to wait until the CSRD is out there. So if we were doing that, we would need to wait until 2026. But as I said, we are committed to act, to implement by the end of 2024. And this is because we use not data, not the perfect data from the CSRD, but um, the, the data from the private data providers now, also using self-reported data from, from the, to differentiate high and low carbon issuers. And we are now constantly reviewing whether we could also extend this measure to the, the, to the smaller debtors, so to the credit claims. But we need some data before we can move ahead. But this with our general scrutiny now, almost on a daily basis. Th thanks, Elke. I think these are very important uh, additions to the answer uh, that was provided already. Um, and I think it also shows that we've just really, really incorporated in, into our day-to-day -day business. It's not something like climate is, is something we do separately. No, we really like day-to-day -day business incorporating it. Um, now, I want to move to the next question, and I have on my list Lucas Grebo from the New Economics Foundation. Lucas, the floor is yours. 
Hi, hi, Rena. Thanks. Um, yes, uh, I'm from Rico Foundation, which is an NGO working on building a more equitable economy that also works within environmental limits. And I hope, can you hear me all right? Uh, yeah, yes. perfect. Um, Yes, so 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 thanks very much for for inviting us here. And yeah, I, I was echo some comments by by others here that yeah we are very pleased to see you you're taking action that that focuses specifically on on things like carbon footprint or climate impacts and trying to tackle that upfront. So again, going beyond this pure financial risk uh, approach. So that's something that we really welcome. And I wanted to come back to one specific policy area outlined about the corporate bond holdings. Uh, so when you talk yeah, about uh, uh, tilting them according to the climate performance, uh, could I ask, it's probably a question to talk about, like, to, to any of you, uh, tell us a bit more about, about those metrics. And maybe if it's helpful, because I know uh, you've started the Bank of England approach to, to greening its own corporate QE. Uh, so maybe if it's helpful, you can compare uh, your approach with what the Bank of England has done and maybe what, what are the differences, are you using the same or similar metrics or decided to, to make different choices. Uh, and in particular, within that also, yeah, I would be interested to hear uh, so one of the criteria you list is better performance on, on climate climate related disclosures. So I would like to understand what, what do, do you mean by that? Um, thank you. So thank you, Lucas, for your for your questions. So um, I mentioned that we have the three different elements, and I think the Bank of England to a certain degree has also elements. but. Let's take a step back then and just consider the size of our uh, corporate bond holdings. If we own 25-30% um, of the entire corporate bond holdings, whereas Bank of England owns only 3% 3, 3 and our reinvestment flows will be about, let's say for the next few years, about 30 billion per year. And that's about the size, by the way, of Bank of England's uh, corporate bonds. So whatever we do, we have to uh, think carefully uh, that it still keeps the monetary policy stance intact and that. Uh, we don't kind of upset the market uh, with our our measures. So uh, I mentioned the, these three elements, and, and we, of course, uh, at the moment, you can really start only with the backward looking at emissions, because that's the only area where you have uh, more data uh, with different type of sources. But that's only one, one part, and we, we put the main weight on that part. But then we also want to incentivize any companies uh, to transition towards the green economy and towards the Paris Line targets. And therefore, we have this forward-looking target where we look to the ambitiousness of the announced target by any of the eligible issuers. And there are about 340 issuers that are eligible for our corporate sector purchase programs. Uh, and, and then uh, we also give a score for the current uh, disclosure quality and level. So what share of the assets, different assets are, are disclosed. And we put all this together, we made kind of a climate score, and then we adjust uh, based on this uh, ranking of the different issuers, uh, our purchases. And we also um, plan to include the secondary and primary market purchases because we are, we are active on both. And that's slightly different from the Bank of England. Thank you, Toto, uh, for uh, answering this question. If I don't, if uh, I think we've covered this one, if I uh, see, uh, okay, and, uh, Frank, I don't know what, if you want to add something on this one. Go no, I, I understand we have quite some questions in the pipeline still, yes. so uh, so let's uh, try to be as concise. And, uh, yes, that, that was indeed uh, my, my next point. We have 15 minutes left and uh, some questions. So I now want to uh, give the floor to Stan Jordan from Positive Money. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. Yes, indeed, uh, it's difficult to underestimate uh, how much work has been uh, um, put into this. So so thank you for, for that. And uh, yeah, it's a bit with emotion that I can think of the first report we, we wrote a few years ago. And I uh, can see that we checked uh, quite a few uh, policy asks there. So yeah, that's a positive moment for, for, for us today. Um, Along the lines of uh, what Lukas has asked, um, I wanted to be clear on one point, which is on, on the carbon emissions. Um, are you including scope three there? Um, because that, obviously that, that's an important one and something the Bank of England did not do, I think. Um, and on the quarter framework, the, the limit, when you say limit, I mean, 
can the limit go as far as um, basically completely excluding certain assets um, or, or, or not? Are there limits to the limit? I guess is the question. Um, and um, yeah, third, um, on on the, on the green tail shows, and we understand that it was not really in this package because this was about um, uh, implementing the decision a year ago. Um, and I am very happy. I'm very happy that the, the, this package will be reviewed regularly, at least annually. That that's good. Um, my question, perhaps a bit more broad, but is there a sense in the governing council or in the ECB that the decisions made a year ago? Um, you know, how do they match with the new reality that we have today, with the war in Ukraine, with the very high energy prices that are uh, a, a big source of inflationary pressure? And, and from that sense, you know, is there a possibility to, to rethink a bit those, those decisions a year ago? Because now the, the new reality um, urges for even more proactive action, I would say. Um, you know, the more the ECB could support, accelerate, um, investment in energy efficiency and renewables, the, the faster this would reduce some of the sources of inflationary pressure right now, right? Uh, in terms of the, 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 the effect of Russian gas and, uh, and so on. So to what degree is the ECB uh, considering this? And then if you start thinking that way, then this is not just a single mandate issue. This is actually a primary mandate uh, consideration, I would say. So I'm, I, it's a broader question, I guess, but yeah. How how is the ECB feeling about this, uh, or at least you, Frank, as a member of the board of the and of the governing council? How do you feel about this particular issue? And are you one of those members that uh, Christine Lagarde mentioned as being uh, open to reopening the discussion on green tail Chevron? Well, thank you very much. Um, thank you. Maybe uh, I I take the uh, the third part of the question, and then my colleagues can take the other ones. Um, I noticed that when I said that uh, we were going to be a little bit shorter to give everyone the floor, the questions became longer. Uh, but uh, but that is uh, that's very much forgiven, and I understand your your questions. Um, um, you know, I would say that um, a, a climate change um, uh, has has a has a and, and everything that we are doing uh, here today has a longer and a broader um, um, a time frame. Than you know, looking at 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 you know at at, at current uh, current inflation, uh, current um, um, geostrategical uh, developments, if you like, um, it's true uh, that um, uh, you know the the terrible uh, uh, war in Ukraine has uh, uh, underlined for all of us um, yet another reason uh, why it is so important to actually make um, uh, progress in the uh, energy transition. So if you allow me, what I would draw from that is that the likelihood of that transitioning happening has increased. Um, uh, it is not just um, uh, being pushed now uh, solely by, uh, by climate considerations, uh, but also by, if you like, uh, energy independence considerations. So, so from our perspective, it means that um, uh, the policy makers uh, in terms of, uh, of climate policies, uh, i.e. in the EU in the end, uh, you know, the, the co-legislators uh, are, um, uh, are, 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 are probably more, more likely uh, to continue on a path that they were, by the way, already uh, pretty determined uh, to continue. So in that sense, I would say uh, these developments are, uh, are relevant. Um, but over to you, um, um, does it. Maybe I can take the second question and then Toto takes, takes the last one. So on, on the collateral limits. So, um, in fact, yeah, indeed, if you put the limit at zero, one could completely uh, exclude bonds, but then we would have said it's in exclusion. So we are not going to put the limit at a level of zero. So because we do not want to exclude any assets. And also, um, as I mentioned, um, so we, it's important that ample collateral remains available. That means for all asset classes. So we, we have to duly calibrate uh, the measure and also the, this, in particular this limit, um, such that we do not unduly constrain um, the sufficient collateral availability. And also the measure needs, needs to be proportionate. 
But as, as mentioned before, um, there will be more detailed announcements on, on the details when we come closer to the implementation date. So thank you, Stanislav. I'm glad that you asked the first question because uh, that's one, one difference uh, as, you, as you alluded to. I mentioned the three elements we use for the tilting scoring uh, and we use scope one and two for all those elements. But then in addition, for the backward looking part, we don't use at the issuer level scope three, but we have included it at, at the sectoral level. So uh, we kind of uh, uh, do a combination of a best in class, best in universe in order to take the most meaningful sectors into account. So, so that is now taken into account and we see that it will be in the future EU benchmarks and, and, and the regulation as something that will be reported better and better. And we felt that it's not yet uh, appropriate quality level on the issue level, but we can take it into account to, to a certain degree at the sector level. And just to complement the second, uh, second point on the sales or exclusion, uh, Elke mentioned collateral. I can just mention that a year ago, Governing Council gave guidance that uh, we should think about an inclusive approach and, and not sales at this moment. And we can make the tilting so that uh, we will align towards the Paris line path without the, the sales before our portfolio. Thanks again for the, the answers to the question. Uh, I see we're running a bit out of time, so I would like to ask everyone to um, put their questions in the chat in case we don't have time to answer them all. Uh, we can come back to you in another way in written format. Uh, but I think we have time for one last question, and that is uh, from uh, Michael Human from Children's Investment Fund Foundation. Uh, Michael, the floor is yours. Thanks, Irene. Um, it, it's a short one, follows a couple of prior. Um, obviously, looking at emissions um, disclosure and CSRD is an important starting point, but um, we have many uh, NGO partners, technical partners, many investors and governments, the UK, for instance, with its transition plan task force, which is really looking beyond this base, basic um, disclosure towards really more detail about what companies are doing to transition their businesses and their performance in doing that. And, and if you had any thoughts you could share quickly about how you you might be looking to evolve the technical frameworks here over time and the opportunity for all of us to partner with you in doing that because we obviously need to ultimately focus on on detailed transition plans and performance um, alongside these um, baseline disclosure indicators thank you well I Thanks for your for your question. I think that's a very important uh, topic that we will focus on uh, more. We've so far used the kind of entire Euro system uh, force to learn these things together and uh, and being in touch then on an individual basis. But that's something that we plan to do. Maybe think more in the future that which would be the best way to uh, to focus on the ambitions of those uh, transition plans. Of course, we try to follow the kind of. Uh, best standards which exist in the market and i think we probably come up with more details closer to october when we start our our tilting and, and maybe to add more generally michael to your question or your offer that you stand ready to engage um i think more generally i would like to just invite all of you uh you know we have we have a climate uh, um, a change center uh, irene as many of you know uh, leads that and um you know we have a team of people that stands ready to, to engage uh, also outside this a little bit more formalized conversation that we have today. Um, so, so, you know, in the coming months, the coming years, uh, whenever you have insights, trying to understand what we are doing, and you feel that you have, uh, you know, knowledge that, that could be helpful for us, uh, please uh, reach out. Yes, uh, thank, thanks so much. And, uh, and I just want to echo Frank, uh, please, uh, please reach out. Uh, we're sent ready and uh, it's a journey we're on together and your uh, input is very uh, much valued uh, by the European Central Bank. With this, um, I want to ask, uh, I think we're closing soon and I, want, I think a survey will appear soon on your screen. If you have a few seconds or minutes to fill that out, that would, that be, would be great. And maybe Frank, uh, you want to say a few last words for now, or um, 
you've done that already. Well, I, well I, I mean, I can do that. Um, um, and, you know, I, I think, let me put it this way. It, it is reassuring, uh, two things. One, that many of you who have, uh, uh, and I think it's a super useful role that you play, who have critically followed us, are critically following us, are saying, uh, we recognize uh, that today the ECB um, is making real progress. I think that's that's valuable. That 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 is um, something that you give back. And at the same time, um, you stay true to your role by saying, "But um, uh, you know, there's uh, so much more that one could consider." Uh, and we continue to have ideas that we want to share with you, uh, and we want to invite you to uh, to to take seriously. So I think that combination of things uh, is um, uh, you know is, is 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 extremely welcome i hope uh, that um, that you uh, on the basis of the last uh, uh, years and what we are doing today that you feel that um, we do try uh, to uh, to take seriously any uh, uh, any insights that you give to us and uh, and i hope this sets the tone uh, for many years to come uh, so that uh, together uh, with all our stakeholders and you are a very important part of that um and uh, as i always say as a lawyer uh, within our mandate uh, we can do as much as we can uh, in this um this 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 super important challenge of climate change can i can i just uh, add my thanks as well uh to all of you because many of you have uh, contacted us and sent your proposals and uh, as frank mentioned they are very important. They give us thoughts. We then work with the nuts and bolts kind of level and see that uh, what's possible, what's appropriate with all the considerations we have with monetary policy and legal, legal issues. But the ideas are really, really welcome. And we can also check that uh, whether we have thought everything. So many thanks to everyone. Thanks a lot, uh, Elke, Frank and Toto, the three of you for uh, setting out uh, our measures that we have taken and answering all the questions. Uh, thanks a lot of all the participants today. Thanks for listening to us. Thanks for engaging with us. Um, now I want to round up this, uh, this hour with you and I'm uh, looking forward to further engagements uh, with you and wishing you a very, very nice day. Thanks so much.